It's time for the Tigers to start playing somebody that has a different colored jersey. The Tiger Football Report starts now. Welcome to the first edition of the Tiger Football Report. I'm your host, Spiro Marikas, along with the head coach of the Tigers, Rob Ambrose. And coach, at what point do your players get tired of seeing each other and saying, I need to hit somebody else? Uh, about a week ago. Honestly, it was about a week ago. And it's not, it's not outward. It's not discussed. Uh, we haven't done anything crazy. Nobody's done any made bad decisions. But... You can just tell they're tired of running the same defense, the same offense. They're tired of tackling the same. We know after playing the same team for a month, we know all the ins and outs on both sides of the ball, and it's a constant stalemate. Let's take this team, many of whom were on the football team last season, did not end the way you wanted, bad taste in everyone's mouth with the way the season ended with the loss to Duquesne in the playoffs. How did that carry over into spring ball and where you went from there to training camp? Well, first, you, you kind of say this, outside, if, if you're the 1A level, outside of the college football playoff, like, it's a different life. You play your season, maybe play a conference championship game, maybe you don't, and if you win enough games, you go to a bowl game. You go to a bowl game in a nice town, in a warm city, and they celebrate you, and it's really, you get a couple weeks off, and you practice for a week, and you have a great time. Woo. They give you a lot of gifts. Yeah, and, and you know, season ended kind of the way you wanted it to. At the FCS level, that doesn't happen. There's only one team in America that ends the season the way they want to, and that's the national champion, that somebody else is gonna lose. And we had to take both that and how to do that, to be the happiest team in America at the end, into conversation. That at this level, you travel all over the country. It's the late November, early December, or late December, and usually the weather's horrible. It's really cold, it's really snowy and wet and rainy, and you then maybe if you make it all the way, you get to Frisco, Texas, but when we got there, it was still cold. So that is a conversation that started in January. We moved spring practice up in January. So it could be colder. It could be more disgustingly terrible outside so we could go practice in it because that's playoff football in America at this level. And it wasn't anything that that group had ever discussed before because, frankly, we weren't prepared to be in that situation. So that's kind of how we got over the hump, but I will tell you that... Um, the last thing you eat is the last thing you eat, and whether it's a day or a month, the taste is still there. We need to play somebody else to get the taste out of our mouth. So you come into training camp this year. You have a veteran group, although you've got some young players that you're very excited about. What differences do you see in this team in training camp and what you had to do as opposed to some of the teams you've had in prior seasons that maybe were a bit younger? As they are older, they are more experienced, and they actually have a little bit of wisdom to them. That they go about their day pretty professionally in, in the weight room, in the training room, on the football field. They understand the level of effort, concentration, focus that it takes to be nationally ranked and get back to the playoffs. They take that as the standard now. It's not teaching them to do that, and they know that. And then it's, okay, that plus one, plus one more day. How many days can we stack? And that's how you make it all the way. So. The quality of work that we do is way more consistent than it's been the last couple of years. That uh, we're just not going to let, we, we raise the bar and now we're going to hold it there. You come into the year, you have several players that have gotten a lot of accolades coming into the preseason. Your quarterback, Tom Flacco, your running back, Shane Simpson, both on the uh, Walter Payton watch list. You've got a first team All-American kicker in Aiden O'Neill, who has a chance to break the all-time FCS record for most field goals in a, in a career. So those guys are getting the accolades, but 
Tom Flacco and Shane Simpson both know they can't do anything if the five guys in front of them aren't doing their job. And you've got some changes on the offensive line. How do you feel about your offensive line going into the first game? Like I bought a puzzle that looks really cool, but we're still re arranging all the pieces. And when they all come together, I'm really going to like what I see. There's some really great parts to this puzzle, exceptional parts. I said before, I said I got tired of us looking not as big as some of our higher end opponents. And I think when we get off the bus now, nobody's going to look at us like we're small. No way. <laughs> you just took the words out of my mouth because I remember when you first got here saying when you played Villanova and you looked on the other side of the field and you were like, that's who we got to play? There was a certain differential there, yes. And now you look at your offensive line and it is, it, I can safely say, it's the biggest in Towson history. Oh, you would know that better than I would, but I, you know they're big. And not only are they big, but they can move. And, that's, and they're smart and they're good kids. I mean, I couldn't ask for any more. I mean, we've had great offensive linemen guys that worked really hard to become great. I mean, Eric Pike probably played more football games in his career than any football player who ever played here. Um, but he built himself into that. Some of these guys are just born bigger, and they're getting bigger. I, I, I'm not a small guy. I'm not a huge guy, but standing next to them, sometimes I feel really, really small. And with an offensive line, is it repetition? And, and the, you know, what we see in week one is probably not what we're going to see oh, in week six or seven. I don't think you see that at any level. That, that, you know, you'll see, I mean, back in the day, way back in the day, we'll remember this, we had two days for a month. So that's two practices a day, seven days a week for 30 days. We can't even have two days anymore. The number of practices that we have now are monstrously less than what we used to be. And because of it, as you watch any college football at any level, it tends to be a little sloppier early in the season. We just don't have as many practices. You don't have to change the rules and don't have that many practice opportunities. But each team, each good team evolves throughout the season. And if you looked at how we played and who we were early in the season and then look at, like, say, the Elon game, we probably looked entirely different. And it's just the evolution of a football team. Defense. New defensive coordinator. What kind of changes does that bring? Uh, tons. Different verbiage, different philosophy, different mentality. Um, and the kids have really taken to it. Eric's a really excitable coach, uh, and I, some of the young guys are really taken to him. We're, we pressure. I don't know another way to say it. We pressure. We pressure, and then when we're done doing that, we pressure some more. And for us, offensively, it's a change. When you're playing your own defense, and that's all they play for a month, it's a challenge. It really is. And uh, the good news is, as we go into some of the unknowns in week one, we've seen every front possible. I think we've seen every blitz possible. And our guys aren't phased by any of it. So throw the kitchen sink at us. We're okay. We should mention there's also a new offensive coordinator. How has he changed things? Uh, not much. You know, he's always been around. He's always paid attention a little bit and been involved in some degree. Uh, the good news is, and this is the truth, but there's a, the offensive staff is extremely strong, extremely veteran, very seasoned, very wise. And everybody's in this together. I mean, th these guys have great experience and been successful everywhere they win. So, uh, makes it kind of easy sitting in that chair. All right, the Citadel coming up this week. Last year you were winners 44 to 27. They're a team, like most military academies, they run the football and run the football. But when they throw, they averaged over 22 yards of reception, and Raleigh Webb, who was their leading receiver, is back this year. They rushed for over 300 yards against you last year, but you were able to handle them 44-27. When do you start working on their offense? I mean, you can't spend all the training camp working just on one team, right? February. We started in February, just like we did the year before. Okay. It, the triple option is unlike anything else that you see in college football. It really is. And, and it's so different than the normal preparation that you have to set rules in place well ahead of time that the kids can draw from. So we were once a week during spring football, running Citadel's offense against our defense. We started that in February. How do you replicate that offense? Because your guys aren't used to playing it, so how do you get a scout team that can, can do it in a, in a, in a way that, that is representative of what the Citadel does? That we, well, we run what they run, but we don't have a football. So everybody has an assignment, and the discipline of their assignment doesn't matter who has the ball. Everybody, you got to do this. You have to tackle that guy. You're responsible for that. That's the pitch key. You're responsible for that guy. And all 11 have to be disciplined with great eyes on every play. And if you do it, you can shut them down. But they wear you down. They bore you. 
So you get lazy eyes, you do something you're not supposed to, and they strike you. You mentioned first week of the year, things can get sloppy. Um, you played the Citadel after two or three games into the season last year. Does it make a difference that you're opening with a team that runs this type of an offense? I, I'd feel a little bit better if we had a couple more weeks in cleats under our belt um, going into this. But we've prepared well. We've prepared consistently for an extended period of time. So, heck, man, we're just happy to play somebody else. How about playing the first game on the road? Good? Yes and no. I, I, I would prefer to play nine games at home. I, you know, I would prefer to wait nine games at home, win them all, and pack Johnny United Stadium. We were talking about this over the summer that when I went to my conference meetings and the head coach was like, how's your student section? Are they still in? Are they, are they not, not in? You guys tailgating? They even asked, you guys tailgating? Yeah, we tailgate. Yeah, it's not. They're definitely afraid of our students that when our kids packed the house in that three or four year run when we were killing it, they were scaring. Uh, they ruined people when they got down near the 30 yard line on the others. Couldn't score. Guys committing penalties, they were brutal. What a the top 12th, 13th, 14th man. I always complain about officials never see the extra player on the field. We had 14, 15 of them when they had the student section like that. So uh, I'd rather play at home, but right about now, we've practiced football against each other for so long, we would go to Alaska to play. Just let us go play somebody else. All right, well, it will not be Alaska temperatures on Saturday in Charleston, South Carolina, trust me. Gordy Combs and I will have a call for you at 2.45 on CBS Sports Radio 1300. So uh, it is week number one, and we hope you can all tune in this Saturday as the Tigers try to get back to the FCS playoffs for the second year in a row. For the head coach of the Tigers, Rob Ambrose, I'm Spiro Marikas. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, go Tigers.